Hello, and welcome to Fueled by Impact. Today, I want to talk to you one-on-one about loving your work. It's a topic that is personally relevant to me, and I think it's really a perennial subject. It's something that humans have grappled with for a long time, and something that I think the last year and a half in particular that we've all lived through has a lot of people taking a step back and questioning things more deeply. So I want to offer you some things to think about. One of my personal missions is to encourage people to live lives more true to themselves, to take chances, to make your work an expression of what brings you meaning and and passion. And the world wants that for you. It wants that from you, truly. There's a reason that you feel unhappy or dissatisfied when you aren't doing that. That's a signal. It hurts not to follow your heart. And for the leaders out there, you are in a position to not only inspire people through your own living example of this, but you're in a position to tangibly help other people find their own path, to chart their course. Same goes for the parents out there. Think about how different it is for a child to grow up seeing a parent loving what they do, or at least taking a risk to try to do that, compared with a parent who plods along, dissatisfied. I think that finding work you love and pursuing a life of intention and of purpose is one of the essential challenges of a lifetime. I don't come to you as this success story and telling you, you know, follow steps one through 10. I'm in the trenches right now. I am racking up failures and mistakes right and left, but I've spent a lot of time with this question. So I want to share some things that I believe are important if loving your work is important to you. A good portion of what I have to share does accord with the research that's out there. But I'm sharing it through my own lens, derived from personal experience, one human to another human. So here we go. I believe there are five essential elements to deeply enjoying what you do. Seven, if you include a couple of mundane realities, which are time and money. By time, I mean that in most cases, if you work too much, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing because it's going to lose its luster. Burnout is a real thing. And money... Money, 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 money. Because if you aren't making enough money, the financial struggles are going to pollute your overall well being. The key word is enough. And that is a whole other subject. And we are not going to unpack that here. So now that I have dispensed with the time and money mundane realities, let's talk about the other five. Do you need all five of these elements to be happy? To some extent, yes. But some elements are going to be more important to you than others, depending on your personality, which is great. You've got a great personality and your values. So let's dig in. Number one, autonomy, autonomy. I think there's something baked into the human animal that rebels against limitations. We do not like confines. We were born to be free. Stick us in a cage and we suffer. You know, we do not thrive in that environment. So I think it's almost universal that being given autonomy in our work is crucial to our enjoyment and satisfaction. Research also tells us this. Now imagine for a minute being told what to do right down to the most minute details. Show up to work and wear this uniform. Only talk to these people, follow these steps exactly, and this schedule right down to the minute. Don't step out of line. You are only permitted to make these decisions, all the other decisions, every other decision must be made by your superior. You dig in this? Probably not so much. Probably sounds a little bit like prison life. We thrive on having autonomy, the power to decide how we spend our time, what we do and how we do it. And the truth is that not all work situations provide us equally with the level of autonomy that we personally need in order to feel satisfied. There is some threshold for you. There's some threshold that you personally need to be above at work when it comes to autonomy. That threshold is going to differ for different people, but you have a threshold and I don't think you can compromise on this one and ever be satisfied. Autonomy. Okay, number two, creativity. This one is often related to the first point, but it ties more directly to the nature of the work itself. The word creativity usually evokes something specific in people's minds, but I'm not talking about being a graphic designer versus being an accountant. I am of the mindset that anything can be a creative endeavor because to me, it's more about generating new ideas. It's about making new novel connections. It's about finding clever ways to solve problems. Humans are problem solvers. There is something innately satisfying in the moment of making a new connection or solving a problem. And I believe that a part of this is tied to an inner freedom of sorts. 
The creative act itself, the creative insight only comes when you step out of the way, in a sense. It's like the principle of flow. Flow states are some of the most satisfying states to be in. You're not there in the conventional sense. You are not there. It's almost like you are a channel for the free flow of ideas. So that is creativity. And this is one of those dimensions that I think matters more to some people than it does to others. Some people prefer the comfort of being told what to do, of coloring within the lines. But others, we crave the freedom to create, to dance at the edge of the novel. And if that is you, it is so important that you find work that nurtures that side of you. Number three, connection. Connection is another fundamental human drive. And I believe this one is really important in your work as well. I noticed the incredible importance of this through the lack of it that I personally felt when I was going through my own recent transition from being the leader of a large organization to being a solopreneur. There was this shock to my system and I felt this sense of loneliness. And in part, I think it was because the one thing that stood out most about my prior situation was how much I loved the people that I worked with. I actually think a lot of people experienced something similar to what I experienced during the pandemic because it negatively impacted true connection. I personally suspect that the spike in remote workers and hybrid workforces is going to have some consequences on this dimension. Zoom, Teams, and so forth. I mean, they're a great addition, but they're not a total substitute. When I was an advisor to CEOs, the CEO on one of my projects flew me from the US to Paris, where I spent a grand total of five hours on the ground. Never left the airport. Charles de Gaulle was all I saw. No Eiffel Tower visit, no Champs Elysees, no Patisserie. Just five hours on the ground in an airport in order to meet with a board member face to face because it was a really important relationship to cultivate. It's not because this was before the era of Zoom. We had a souped-up video conference capability in our office, but breaking bread, drinking wine while sitting down face-to-face -face is a very different experience from a FaceTime call. The ability to connect is different. The ability to form deeper relationships is different. So I'm not defending the environmental implications of flying to Paris for five hours. It's just an extreme situation to highlight the importance of connection. And deep connection is a deep human need. It's not that our work needs to be what fulfills us entirely on this dimension, of course. We can obviously get this from other aspects of our lives, but most days, most of us spend more time at work than anywhere else. Creating meaningful connections with people is a huge driver of satisfaction in work. Well, let's go to number four. Number four, I am calling mastery of a craft. This one also shows up in the research, but I'm going to color this one with my own brush, if I may. What the research points to, and I definitely concur with this, is that it feels good to get good at something. We like to feel competent. The opposite of this is imposter syndrome, which most of us have experienced. Good chance that you're experiencing it right now, you fraud. Watch out. It is only a matter of time before they discover you. It feels good to feel like we got things under control, like we're competent or like we have expertise. The word mastery does have some baggage, and it's a word that I use frequently, fully aware of this downside. The point is not that you need to be a master to feel satisfied. The satisfaction comes with the learning and growing itself. There's inherent satisfaction in the process of mastering a craft. When you can love the process of getting better at a thing, and you genuinely feel like you are becoming more competent, more of an expert, and so forth, this tends to translate directly into your enjoyment of that endeavor, provided that it's a craft that you inherently enjoy. In other words, it has to align with your unique gifts, your talents, your interests in the right way. If you enjoy numbers, you may enjoy mastering the craft of financial modeling, or accounting, or theoretical mathematics. If you don't like numbers, those ain't your craft, comrade. Probably seems obvious enough, but the truth is that this topic is not an obvious one for most people. A lot of people struggle to know the things that they enjoy or that bring them passion. And so for those who do struggle with that, it's good to look at what brought you joy as a kid or what you do in your spare time or what aspects of your work 
energize you versus drain you. And there's a lot of other things you can do as well to touch into this, to get familiar with this and to understand the kinds of things that lend themselves to being a good craft for you to master. But it pays to do this because if you can find a craft that you genuinely enjoy putting in the time to gain skill and expertise, you have checked this all important box number four on my master list. Number five, let's talk number five. Number five, I call this one impact. And then I will promptly asterisk, asterisk, that is a hard word to say sometimes, asterisk this word and bust out my paintbrush and do a little painting. So impact, this final element of loving your work, it has to do with how your work impacts other people. Do you feel like your work is important? Does it make a difference? Does it feel meaningful to you? Does it fill you with a sense of purpose? That's what this is all about. A lot of the discussion to this point and a lot of the discussion in general when it comes to finding work that you love or job or career satisfaction, it centers on you, what you want, how you can be happier and more fulfilled. But this fifth element is so important because it's primarily about something bigger than you. And anytime we shift our focus away from our own self-concern, instead of that having the consequence our fearful self expects, like if I don't focus on myself, things aren't going to work out to my benefit. Instead of that, the opposite usually happens. We actually feel happier. We feel more fulfilled. It's this strange but wonderful paradox that the wisdom of the ages and research from modern day both demonstrate over and over again. And your experience does as well, your own experience here. We feel our best when we're focused on serving or helping other people. And that's the essence of this fifth element. So that rounds out our list. So now I want you to imagine for a moment that each day you wake up, you roll up your sleeves to do your work, and that work has these characteristics. You get to decide what you work on and when and how you do it. You get to be as creative as you wish. You get to try new things or find new ways to do things, creating things to share with the world. The work also allows you to have meaningful connections with other people. You get to form relationships that matter in the context of this work. And you enjoy the process behind the work. You love mastering the craft itself of learning of growing, of building this specific expertise, of employing certain talents that you have, of sharing your unique gifts, and your work matters. It positively impacts other people. It brings real value to those around you in a way that you can tangibly feel, that you can clearly see. And oh, by the way, the work provides you with financial sustenance without requiring you to burn yourself out or sacrifice other important priorities in your life. Sounding pretty good, right? I think we're on to something, Michael. Yes, yes, we are. All right. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you're feeling dissatisfied or unhappy, take some time to evaluate how well your situation rates on each of these elements. This reflection may help you uncover ways in which you can begin to improve your situation right now, because often there are things that you can do to flex up on these dimensions, even within the confines of your current situation. And that is actually a subject we can dig into another time. Alternatively, if you're in this unlucky, hopeless sort of situation where things just aren't going to get better, you're not able to really influence these dimensions, then this reflection can serve you as a guide for evaluating your next steps. If you are a leader of other people, I encourage you to take some time to reflect on how you can help foster these dimensions with your team. I haven't gone into any depth here on the leadership angle of this, but I'd like to start workshopping this more with leaders and potentially with their teams. All right. So those are some of my reflections on this topic. If you enjoyed this, if you got any value out of this, please consider sharing this with someone that you feel may benefit, particularly someone who may be struggling with dissatisfaction in their work or someone in a leadership role who has the capacity to influence the fate of many other people. We really need to wake as many people up to this as possible if we want to cure this epidemic of workplace malaise. Am I right? I can't hear you. Literally, I can't hear you, obviously, because it's a podcast. 
If you're interested in diving deeper on this one, I would encourage you to sign up for my newsletter. In addition to various articles and musings, it's the surest way to get notified when I release my upcoming books and audiobooks, one of which may be a deep dive into this very subject. Go to MikeCav.com for that. That is M-I-K-E-K-A-V.com. Yeah. And I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts. Don't be shy. Thanks for listening.